Welcome to Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75, a series by the Planetary Podcast. In Common Home Conversations, you will hear from leading global experts on how the proposal of recognizing the existence of an intangible global common without borders can change our relationship with our planet. The Common Home of Humanity has proposed an ambitious new global pact for the environment. The adverse effects of climate change span across borders and beyond territories. Recognizing the Earth system as a common heritage of humankind is the first step in restoring a stable climate, a visible manifestation of a well-functioning Earth system. This proposal's cascading effects would be systemic and tremendously impact international relations and economics, opening the doors to restoring a well-functioning Earth system. Common Home Conversations is the place to discuss a new social contract between society, economy, and the Earth system. Now, here is your host, founder and CEO of the Planetary Press, Kimberly White. Hello, and welcome to Common Home Conversations. Today, we are joined by Frank Bierman, Professor of Global Sustainability Governance at Utrecht University, Director of the ERC Global Goals Project, Founder of the Earth System Governance Project, and editor of the Earth System Governance Journal. Thank you for joining us today, Frank. Thank you so much, Kimberly. It's a pleasure being with you. So you're a professor of global sustainability governance at Utrecht University and founder of the Earth System Governance Project. Can you tell us more about these experiences and the focus of your current research? Oh, thank you so much. Well, there are two different functions. Let me just explain both of them. The one is, of course, my normal professional function. I'm a professor of global sustainability governance at Utrecht University. That means, essentially, I am a political scientist. I also have some background in international law. But essentially, my research, my interest in teaching also is uh, political science international relations. So I'm driven by trying to better understand how we can create institutions that can deal better with problems of global environmental change. We know that the Earth system, the entire Earth system is today transformed by human actions. Climate change is accelerating and we have to struggle very hard to keep global warming under 1.5 degrees. Species extinction, worldwide spread of plastics in the oceans, ozone depletion, all these kind of problems are essentially global problems. That means countries have to work together. Governments need to agree on joint goals. They have to get together to share resources, to share knowledge, and governments have to adjust their policies. And we all have to change to adjust to these kind of challenges. And for that, we need international institutions. We need international governance. And so far, these institutions are not effective. They're not really able to cope with these challenges. So therefore, we need better institutions. We need better global governance. And this is what keeps me busy for the last 30 years. This is my field of research. This is the field of my teaching. And this is also where I'm personally extremely passionate about. I should add also that it's not necessarily just a picture of win-win. It's not that we just need to have a better institutional design and then everything will be resolved and everything will be better. Instead, I'm very much concerned about conflicts of power and the global inequalities and all kind of conflicts that we have that countries are in a variety of relationships of inequality, dependence, post-colonialism, etc. So this is also part of the story of international institutions that we have to take into account and want to understand how we can try together to achieve an equitable and more sustainable future for all within the natural basis and the natural conditions of our planet. So this is my research. This is what I'm working on, and this is the key area of my chair as a professor of global sustainability governance at Utrecht University as part of the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development at Utrecht. And Earth System Governance is a slightly different story. It is not only about research, certainly not about my own research. It is about a network. It's about global networking to jointly study these questions that I have just laid out. And here we are a bit building on models that have been developed in the natural sciences in terms of global research collaboration. In the earlier years, like in the 19th century, social science was very much an individual activity. People were just there, they read a book, and you write a book, and you read a couple of books, and then you continue the progress of scientific knowledge in the social sciences. And this is essentially the model of the 19th century and the 20th century in the social sciences. And I believe that we cannot continue like this any longer. So we have to 
work much more together. And the natural sciences have done this already since the 1950s, working together in large communities and large networks where you exchange data, you exchange scientific insights, you work according to large science plans for sometimes five, ten years where hundreds of scientists work together and try to jointly really better understand the reality and what's going on. And this is a model that natural scientists have done for quite some time. And I believe it's also very much important for the social sciences. And this is essentially what the Earth System Governance Project is about. It's a global network. It's a network where hundreds of scientists are coming together and jointly discuss findings, research methods, questions, and theories about this big challenge of governance and the transformation of the entire Earth system. So we're not talking about air pollution. We talk about the transformation of the entire Earth system. We're not talking about protection of individual species in our neighborhoods. We talk about the six mass extinction of species that are kind of being extinct on a huge scale. We're talking about sea level rise. We're talking about land degradation. We are talking about ozone depletion of the stratospheric ozone layer. Half of the habitable land on Earth we are using for agriculture, we have totally transformed the planet. And I think this is a situation that requires a new perspective. And this is not the perspective of environmental policy. This is a perspective where we have to discuss these governance problems, the governance challenges of the entire planetary system. And this is why we have developed this concept of Earth system governance, which means institutions that are dealing with social ecological systems at planetary scale. During your time working in this field, have you seen any shift in environmental governance policy towards a more Earth system-based approach? Uh, not on a systemic level. I think some of the key issues are not sufficiently addressed at the political space. Uh, climate change certainly is. I mean, climate change certainly is a big issue also because of the youth movement that are associated with it. And I think it's a key issue in many countries, not in all countries, but like in the Netherlands, where I'm based, is certainly one of the key issues in political discourse. So there I see certainly a change. I mean, when I, I started my career, it was a marginal issue. It was a fringe issue. When we went to international conferences on international relations, for example, the environmental committee was extremely small. And now in the International Studies Associations, one of the big institutions in science and in the study of international relations, now the environmental studies section there is one of the largest. And this change is certainly there. I miss the change on a variety of other issues, like food, for example. I'm missing a strong focus on some of these big, big issues that we have to discuss, like the provision on food in a times of climate change and, and also many of the responses to climate change, where I believe that the provision of food is one of the big challenges in the future. And here I'm missing strong political attention to these kind of issues. And this is one of the issues that I'm working on to, to bring this forward. But generally, I mean, there is an increase of attention in the public debate, in the political debate, but it's surely not enough. I mean, that's surely not enough. I think the sense of crisis is not very strong yet in the political system uh, and also not in societies. I mean, if you look at, at the public debates, I mean, like the, the political needs, for example, on climate change of decarbonizing our societies within one generation, is, it's a huge challenge. And you don't see it sufficiently reflected in daily politics. So therefore, it's better than in the 1990s. Change is there, but it's surely not sufficient yet compared to the challenges that are ahead of us in this generation. Absolutely. And I know with the recent NDC synthesis report, and we talked about this in a previous interview with Princess Esmeralda of Belgium, with the current NDCs, we're still not at that level of ambition needed to meet the Paris Agreement goals. And that's problematic. But thankfully, I would say one thing that has come out of the pandemic has been the discussions about the need for a green recovery. So I'm hopeful that we'll start to see some real concrete action moving forward. I fully agree. I mean, I fully agree. I mean, this kind of public knowledge that what has been committed to by governments so far and also other societal actors is absolutely not sufficient to achieve the decarbonization challenges that are ahead of us. And they have to be implemented. I mean, it's, it's very clear that we have to drastically reduce our emissions within one generation. And we have to start now. And the 
current policies are not sufficient. So I think this is one of the big, big challenges. As I said, I mean, Corona is an important issue for the one or the two years now. But the big challenge I had is uh, climate change, but also some other issues of Earth system transformation. So we are really observing massive changes in the planetary systems, and we have to take urgent action. And this is not happening so far. And this is important, for example, in climate change. I mean, there are debates driven by some people to use alternative, which could be like geoengineering. That some people say that politically we are not achieving the decarbonization challenges and targets. So, so therefore, we should have totally different approaches, which I'm not supporting, uh, to be very clear. But these alternative futures of a geoengineered climate are well on the table and are very much discussed. And tomorrow we will have a new report by the National Academy of Science of the United States, which is discussing uh, geoengineering. So we have to see what the outcome of this report will be. But the decision that the current generation is, is taking is, is, is fundamental. And also to make it very clear, I'm very much objecting to the one frame, which is this what I call the one humankind frame, that it's all one humankind. And I'm also tempted sometimes to speak in this mode, I probably did already in the last couple of minutes, about we, we, the humans, we, the people. And it's not like that. I mean, there are people who are consuming much about the global average, and these are the rich countries in the north. Uh, and other people have been much less responsible for the challenge for the problems that we have now and are probably also be much more vulnerable to the impacts of earth system transformation so it's a huge inequality challenge also that we are facing and this has to be made very very clear in all of these debates about global sustainability climate change earth system governance etc Absolutely. And, you know, here in the United States, we're the world's second largest emitter, and we only have a fraction of the population of countries such as China and India. I think many of the G20 countries have this issue where we have consumed so much and we always keep consuming. That bigger is better mindset is what has gotten us into this trouble that we're in. And countries such as the island communities who have such a minimal footprint are the ones on the front lines. And they're the ones facing the consequences of our consumption patterns. I fully agree. I mean, this is absolutely the case. And this is very, very important to always keep it in mind, especially uh, in those communities that are more in favor of a one humankind discourse, as I said. This is the discourse of the Anthropocene, for example, which is a new term that has been proposed uh, to describe the current uh, epoch in planetary history as an epoch that is driven by the human species. That's where the name Anthropocene comes from. And, and normally I also use the word, I mean, many of my publications have the word Anthropocene in the title, and I think that is also a very important defining characteristic, but it is hiding or it tends to hide inequalities. And this is very important to bring this all the time uh, onto the table and also discuss it uh, in all kind of policy proposals, which includes also, we come back to this maybe later, uh, my good friends from the common heritage of uh, communal kind uh, idea that I'm very much supporting of, but also here it is very much important to look at global inequalities and to emphasize that the responsibility for the past causation of earth system transformations, particularly climate change, uh, is very much with the rich countries in the north and also the responsibility to address these challenges. And uh, finally, also, it's very much important in the governance structures that we are about to develop in dealing with Earth system transformations so or Earth system governance to develop this in a way that gives a large uh, power in whatever ways it is or takes into account global inequalities and also empowers the vulnerable people in all kinds of decision making that we are setting up. And this is very, very important. You see it in the role of science, for example, I mean, to the extent that we give a stronger role for science scientists in decision making, uh, implicitly or explicitly, then we have to acknowledge that the scientific community is essentially based in the global north. So therefore, giving more power to scientists, we have to understand to what extent are they affected or influenced by being citizens of uh, OECD countries. Same as with civil society, with a good colleague of mine, Karl Anselnit, I'm working on a book uh, in which we are discussing uh, imbalances in global civil society. I mean, those people who are in New York in the United Nations and are speaking there for global civil society, we try to understand to what extent are they really representing 
a global civil society and to what extent are they just representing what is seen as global civil society in the rich countries in the north. And it has to do a lot with money, it has to do with funding, it has to do with possibilities, it has to do with discourse of power. And we did uh, lots of interviews and studies of the procedures of how civil society works in New York. And it is very much so that the interest and the organization that are in the one way or the other based in or paid by, funded by uh, the rich countries are those that are most powerful. So inequality is very much a problem also for our system governance, and we have to address it very much in our research. In a previous interview with Anna Barreda of IDMA, she relates that we have a well-developed international legal framework for the protection of the environment, but it's framed in a very siloed manner. There is no interconnectivity. How can an earth system approach better reconcile environmental law with growing social, environmental, and economic concerns? Well, this is a very, very good question. I mean, that is uh, certainly the assessment absolutely true. The governance systems that we have are extremely fragmented at the country level in different ministries where everybody does their own thing, but also at the global level, international organizations, UN agencies, etc. So there is not sufficient integration and coherence and alignment of international and national institutions when it comes to global sustainability and earth system governance. So the problem is absolutely well taken. The question is what to do about it. So at the national level, this is a long-standing debate, how you can try to improve national coherence when it comes to sustainability. It's an open question, but I think therefore we definitely need to have a stronger alliance of uh, institutions at the national level. My work was very much at the global level, trying to understand how we can improve the integration and collaboration of international organizations to jointly achieve sustainability and to work together in a more meaningful way. In 2012, a group of us, 33 authors, uh, we published an, an article which was called Navigating the Anthropocene, Strengthening Earth System Governance, uh, in which we together proposed a United Nations Council on the sustainable development in the sense to set up an integrative body in the UN system at the highest level that would be able and empowered and mandated to uh, integrate uh, the policies and programs of different uh, institutions and organizations in the UN system. This didn't go through, but we got instead is the high level political forum, which is high level well in terms in the terminology, but it's not an, a council with a strong mandate, it's more like a forum. And, and to the extent how it is working, we have to see it. I mean, it was established some years ago, so it's not maybe too early to say whether it's a success or a failure in, in a way, but I have my doubts. It's certainly not what we had proposed originally. Uh, the alternative, what the United Nations also have agreed upon in 2015, are the sustainable development goals. These are 17 large goals that the UN has come up with after a couple of years of negotiations. They have 169 targets, and they are supposed to steer national policies and international policies into the direction of sustainable development in a variety of areas, in food and energy and biodiversity, climate as well, governance and many other areas. And here this is the idea is to break down silos. One of the underlying ideas is to break down the silos and to achieve integration of the social, environmental and economic concerns. Whether it works is a big question. So we surely need probably stronger frameworks to really break down these silence in a more meaningful way. And what is very important also, it's not only just integration and collaboration as such. I think it's very much about the economic organizations, which is the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and a couple of others that are largely outside the standard sustainability policies of the United Nations. And I think here, this neoliberal capitalist approach that these organizations are still taking is one that is harmful for the earth system policies that are needed. And I think here it is very important to bring in more sustainability into these powerful economic organizations and to work towards a much more integrative approach. So I think there are strong arguments uh, in, in favor of uh, changing the, the policies in these organizations, meaning to bring much more of social concerns and ecological concerns into these organizations. So that I think is, is very much important. And this is what the Earth System Governance Project 
is studying, among many other things. So we are really concerned about how all these organizations are collaborating and how key concerns of Earth system governance can be best advanced and, and, and protected. For example, food. I mentioned it already that the provision of food, we have 800 million people who have not enough food today. And the pressures on, on land and on food are increasing tremendously, especially from the climate policy space, where we have an increasing pressure to increase the use of biofuels. Uh, and maybe also in the next 10 or 20 years, an increasing pressure to use land for the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is one thing that is openly discussed as part of the IPCC modeling approaches, uh, many of them. And, and I think so here, it's, it's very important to develop strong global policies that are dealing with the provision of food and the protection of food security for everybody, especially in the most vulnerable countries and, and regions. But overall, I think the integration, so I'm, I'm very much in agreement and, and with the previous speaker, with Honor, and I very much believe that it's important to strengthen the integration of global governance in these domains. Absolutely. And going back to the food aspect, I think it's really important that we recognize that the solutions to our food security problems are not going to be one size fits all. They are going to vary by region and by scale. And it's important that we put more research into that as well and not continue with a path of agricultural production that is harmful to our environment. Because again, everything is interconnected. The World Health Organization mentioned that 75% of new emerging infectious diseases are zoonotic in origin. And the leading causation of that is land clearing. And that's for deforestation and for land conversion for agriculture. So again, everything is interconnected and we have to be mindful while we're coming up with these solutions. Absolutely, yeah. I fully agree. And one part of the story is production of livestock, of course. I, mean, I think it's technically, from a system perspective, one of the almost like a silver bullet. I mean, if you look at the data, I think we're kind of about 50% of the land that is usable on our planet is used for agriculture. So it's kind of everything that is not like a dune or rock or desert or whatever or glacier. This is 50% of that land we're using. The rest is for forests, shrubs, settlements, freshwaters and others. And on of this land, I mean, 77 percent we are using for agriculture for livestock, uh, which is meat and dairy. And so here, technically, I mean, this is a huge part of the terrestrial landscape that is used for a product that is not necessarily needed. So here, I think, strong policies that are reducing the consumption, especially of meat. I mean, it's not the silver bullet as such for, for all kind of problems, but it's certainly helpful. And this is one thing that I'm absolutely missing in the public debate sufficiently. I mean, my students are quite a few of my students are vegetarians, of course, but as a political challenge, I think it's not, uh, we talk about carbon taxes to reduce the amount of, of carbon that the people use. But I would be very much in support also of, of meat taxation and, and regulation to reduce the use of meat because this reduces the pressure as you laid out, but it reduces substantially the pressure on, on land uh, in, in general. I mean, of course, exceptions is a bit more, more, more nuanced, but I think this is one of the, the areas where I think uh, policies could make a difference. Definitely. And industrial agriculture is a leading cause of the climate crisis. Animal agriculture specifically emits around 7 gigatons of carbon dioxide annually, and the majority of those emissions come from beef and cattle. And the process of creating just 1 kilogram of beef requires 25 kilograms of grain and 15,000 liters of water. And that's just not sustainable for our growing population. I mean, it's, of course, I mean, I understand also that, I mean, there wasn't it like the uh, United States that uh, one state has introduced a meat-free day and the other has introduced a meat day. <laughs> so it's a, it is a big societal challenge and debate about But I'm absolutely fully in, in agreement with the data and, and your conclusion that you just laid out. I think this is one of the elements of change that we can accept and drive forward. It certainly is an uphill struggle. I mean, the point is, I mean, what's very important in these debates, I mean, kind of this is among uh, sustainable Sustainability uh, practitioners and scholars, I think there's a lot of agreement on this point. I think one point is, of course, very important for many of these measures, especially taxation. It has to be uh, organized and designed in a way that the poor are protected. And I think it's very important So, if you have any taxation for environmental bads like carbon or meat, it has to be organized in a way that the poor benefit. That was a key issue, especially on carbon taxation. I think it's important to design these policies 
at whatever scale you want to do, national, state-wise in America or globally, that you take uh, the global inequalities, national inequalities into account in whatever you, you want to design. I think that's very, very important. And also, I think it's not only kind of putting the blame on people individually, it's also very much on structures. And that's also important to take into account. So we should not have just an approach where we say people have to change, but certainly they have to. But it's a very much also a challenge to, to change the structures, the economic structures, political structures, to allow a more sustainable lifestyle. So how can Earth system governance help bring about the ambitious changes critical to addressing current and future generations' biggest problems? Essentially, what we are talking about in the Earth system governance project is a transformation of governance systems at the local level, the national level, and the global level. I mean, this is it's interlinked with multi-level governance, so we have to change the way how politically, institutionally, we are governing the local space villages and cities and regions and provinces. We have to change the national system. And also, this is my own personal research, is very much at the global level. So I'm very keen of understanding, especially how we can change the global governance system, which we have inherited from the 19th century, which has been changed a little bit in the 20th century, but we have to make it fit for the 20th first century. And that means to me that we need to have stronger institutions that are able to deal with these challenges, climate change, biodiversity, but also food, water, energy, and providing also these resources to those who are needing them. We need to have a huge public movement, especially in the rich countries in the north, for massive decarbonization, for massive changes in the way how we're dealing with land and water and many of these resources, changes also to the international relations where the north is in many ways still exploiting countries in the south, and this needs to change. And I think this is very much, talking here on this podcast, is very much a challenge for everybody to get involved and participate in working and fighting and struggling for a better world. And I think this is very much a challenge for the current generation, because if you look carefully at the data, the climate change is the biggest example probably again, I think that the current generation is probably the last generation that will not be most brutally affected by climate change. So it's a very, very important point of time right now these years. I mean, these years are so important. And in the American context, uh, since you're based in the United States, uh, so of course, we have a window of opportunity because we had a change in the administration, which means that now these issues are at least higher on the agenda. So it's really a moment where we can really work towards uh, much stronger efforts to keep the planet in some form or shape in the way how we have inherited the Earth from our ancestors. Absolutely. And I think the Earth System Governance initiatives that you're working on have been quite impressive and really help move the needle. And again, we really need to amp up our ambition, like our national commitments. And what we're doing at the state and city level and the business level, we have to continue working toward climate action. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that the war on nature that we're currently waging is suicidal. So we don't have time to wait anymore. We have to do this action now or else, you know, we're not going to have this future that we want for our kids and our grandkids. I fully agree. So in Planetary Justice, a research framework, you discuss how we have begun to see a justice turn in political discourse and the need for a, quote, richer debate on the conceptual foundations of what justice research on global sustainability environmental change could mean, end quote. You also propose a new conceptual framework on planetary justice. Can you tell us more about this framework? Thank you so much. I mean, this is really one of my research projects that are really very dear to my heart. I'm very passionate about it. I mean, just in, in, in basic terms. So first, justice and in, injustice. I mean, I mentioned already, I think, in the beginning of the podcast, uh, we live in an extremely unequal world. I mean, as a human species, the wealth on our planet is uh, absolutely unequally divided. I mean, the data is all well known. I mean, for example, 1% of the richest people on our planet, they have as much wealth than uh, more than half of the humanity. So it's a huge uh, imbalance. I think uh, half of the world population have less than five US dollars per day. And we have this tremendous accumulation of wealth, increasingly also with the billionaires, with the eight richest people in the world. So inequality is tremendous and it has increased a lot over the last 10, 20 years. 
And this, I perceive, I mean, this is a value judgment. I mean, it's not fair, so we have to work towards it. So it's a question of injustice, which is also driving in many ways uh, all kind of sustainability issues. So therefore, also, I mean, it's, I'm not the only person to say this, there's a new or increasing references in the scientific literature also about questions of justice. Environmental justice has been discussed for many, many decades already. Fantastic work has been done on the environmental justice community, and you find it in all kind of uh, other communities as well. So this is what we described as a justice turn in the sustainability debate and the earth system governance debate as well. The point is, and this is what we try to address in this paper, there's no common agreement of justice. I mean, so everybody uses the word and everybody wants to have justice and less equality, but what exactly is meant? This is quite often kind of left vague or not defined or is not further explicated. And this is a problem. So what we try to do in this particular paper that you're referring to is that we tried to create a framework which is built on existing philosophy. So it's not new what we did. We just tried to organize as political scientists and not philosophers, not ethicists, but as, as political scientists, we tried to organize the entire debate of, on justice of the last 2000 years, I mean, kind of in, in very rough ways on very simple questions. Simple questions that we said, so you can, it's almost like a questionnaire that can help people to identify what kind of theory of justice are you adhering to? What is your position when it comes to planetary justice? So this is what we developed. And we did this for a purpose that we hoped that this framework can be used or could be used for research. For example, in integrated assessment models, these are kind of these computer models that are predicting, I mean, they're not predicting our future, but they provide scenarios, they provide an idea about how the future could look like under certain conditions and certain assumptions. And here we believe that these ethical positions that we developed, I mean, the series of justice framework that we developed could be useful to, to shape these scenarios in a way that are much more linked to real philosophical traditions and positions from the literature. So we try to bring it together. We try to bring a framework that can be used for modelers, but it's based on political theory in a much more concrete and much more meaningful way. And the same is also true for text and just for any political position, for any book, for any article, whatever you do, we hope that our framework can help to analyze text, to analyze discourses, and to really make it much more explicit what kind of justice discourse is underlying this particular paper, this underlying this particular position, uh, and try to make it more explicit and therefore have a much more informed discussion about what justice actually means. And this is one part. And the other part is also that we, this is a start. I mean, it's also it's just one paper. So we're still trying to build up a community of researchers that also try to explore in more detail this idea about planetary justice. I and mean, we have environmental justice, but as I said in the beginning, try to explain this. So environmentalism is a little bit the 19th and 20th century. So now we are facing with these issues of planetary transformation, uh, intergenerational justice, interspecies justice, intragenerational justice, all these different problems that come up. And how can we understand justice between species, between generations uh, in a meaningful way? And we try to bring this also forward. And we have, and this is a little announcement almost, we have a task force for that. We have the Planetary Justice Task Force, which is a small network of, of colleagues in the Earth System Governance Project that is uh, discussing these issues and we meet on a regular basis and we exchange papers. We have a special issue in the Earth System Governance Journal in which we are discussing these issues. So it's a very, very exciting uh, area of research. And if anybody has any views and comments, I'm very also eager to hear from the community. So if you listen to this podcast, I'm always keen to hear what, what other people think about planetary justice. Absolutely. And during this time, a lot of the conversation, especially in the last year or two, has been focused around the topic of climate justice. So I find the concept of planetary justice that you discuss particularly very interesting. So can you share your thoughts on the proposal by the Common Home of Humanity? Oh, thank you. Very good uh, question. Of course, yeah, I'm extremely intrigued by this initiative. So I think it's extremely important. It's important to bring together all these different uh, scientific communities that the common home of humanity idea tries to bring together. I'm very supportive of this idea about developing Earth system law. So there's one or two issues I think for the next phase of this line of research, I think are important maybe to consider. One is the issues, I mean, if you look at the text of common heritage, 
Uh, it's, it's a lot about humanity. And as I mentioned earlier, it has a little bit follows this one humankind narrative in the sense that we're all together, we're all happy and, and everything is fine. But this is actually not the, the point. I mean, because humanity is not like that. I mean, so the, the term humanity and the term humankind is blurring any consideration of poverty, uh, conflict, exploitation, colonialism, racism, misogynism, and many other issues. So it's kind of tries to present a picture that is maybe more rosy than it is. And I think it would be great in the further development of the carbon heritage idea and this condomia idea to bring in more the conflictual and uh, inequality aspects of humanities. I think this would be, I think, important also for the, the effect and the impact of this, this fantastic idea. The same is a bit about they're relying a lot on the planetary boundaries concept, which is also has been a major impact on the Earth system science and also Earth system governance idea. But these boundaries are defined by the natural conditions. It's it's a natural science concept essentially. So here the question is where are the social boundaries? I mean, where are the boundaries of our societies in terms of uh, hunger? in terms of uh, exploitation, in terms of uh, lack of shelter, lack of clean water, etc. So these boundaries are equally important, and they're not necessarily part of this concept. And I think they are could be stronger in the common heritage community as well. So I think it's, it's a fantastic idea, but the social boundaries could be brought in. It's not necessarily the way how the well-known donut is doing it in a sense by adding a layer of boundaries. I think it's much more a matter of integration, of integrating social ecological boundaries and social ecological systems. I think that's the, the key way forward. So I would kind of invite, uh, also very happy to discuss it with the colleagues of the common heritage of humankind approach to develop the planetary boundaries concept more into a direction where the social aspects are much, much stronger. So uh, just to put it simply, I think it's really a very, very important initiative. But I think it's important also to strengthen the focus on inequality and injustice and colonialism and many other ways on which humankind is actually not one humankind, but a divided humankind, and to bring in a stronger focus on the social boundaries and social ecological systems, and maybe also to discuss in more detail. But this is something we can maybe do in the years to come about the governance mechanisms that need to be in place to deal with the value conflicts that are inherent in the common home of humankind. All right, and there you have it. The big challenge facing humanity is climate change. Massive changes in the planetary systems have already been observed, and it is imperative that we take action now. Our policies are insufficient, and we need a paradigm shift that integrates social ecological boundaries and social ecological systems. We need to have stronger institutions that are equipped to address the challenges of climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation, while also supporting and empowering the most vulnerable societies in our global community. That is all for today, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Common Home Conversations Beyond UN75. Please subscribe, share, and be sure to tune in on April 21st to continue the conversation with our special guest, Maya Groff, international lawyer and convener of the Climate Governance Commission. And visit us at www.theplanetarypress.com for more episodes and the latest news in sustainability, climate change, and the environment.